Today is Palm Sunday, and I'm sure many of you have heard uh, sermons pertaining to Palm Sunday. And perhaps some of you came to church because it was Palm Sunday. And uh, a story goes like this. There, is a, there was a family who was very faithful to God. They would go every Sunday, week after week, for services. And there was, uh, the, the family had two little kids. So one was a six-year-old girl, and one was a five-year-old boy. And on this Palm Sunday, uh, the little boy fell sick. So he was having, a f having the flu and he couldn't really make it to church. So the parents deliberated and they made a decision and said, you know what, we will leave the boy at home. Let's get a, uh, a babysitter and let's just go to church. So they managed to find a babysitter. So the boy is at home. The parents are at, in church together with the little sister. And since it was Palm Sunday, the pastor decided that he wants to give every one of them a palm branch. So after the service, the parents and the little kid walked in home, uh, waving the palm branch. And then the little boy says, wow, how come y'all are carrying these palm branches? So the father turns around and tells the little boy and says, son, you know, uh, this was done when Jesus came into this place. And people did it as a sign to welcome him and to give him the glory. So the little boy thought for a while and he said, huh? All these years I've been going to church, I don't go to church for one day and Jesus turns up finally. You know, Jesus was taking a journey from Mount Olives, uh, from the Mount of Olives back to Jerusalem. And before he decided to take that journey, he sent two of his disciples up ahead and said, go find a donkey. Or he said, there's going to be a donkey in this particular place. Just untie the donkey and bring him to me or bring it to me. And uh, if they ask you why you want to take this donkey, just make a statement and say it is for the Lord and they will permit you to bring the donkey. So the disciples go bring the donkey and they return to Jesus. And Jesus rides on this young donkey and takes the journey to Jerusalem. And the scripture reads his entry to Jerusalem as this, as we can read in Mark chapter 11 verses 9 to 11. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. We'll also read Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. You see, when we read this scripture, we see that it gives us a very detailed account of Jesus' entry to Jerusalem. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem amidst a lot of praises, amidst a lot of people crying out saying, Hosanna. And the first thing he does, he, he goes into the temple and then he leaves the temple and, he say, and, it, and the scripture records that he went to Bethany. The next day, Jesus comes back to the temple and he begins to drive out the traders that were in the temple. Now in this account, I see that there are some very significant instances and there are some important statements that Jesus makes in this scripture. And this morning, what I want to do is take some time to look at it. I would like to title my sermon as... What is your house? What is your house? As I said, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and the first thing that happens is the remarkable entry that he makes. He's welcomed. The people are praising him. They're shouting, saying, praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kin kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest. We need to take a step back here. All this while... There has been speculation, there has been questions being asked about who Jesus is. Who is this man who was healing the sick? 
Who is this man who forgives the sinner? Who is this man who even touches the leper? Who is the man who talks with the prostitute? This man clashed with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he was always in argument with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But it seems like when Jesus was walking back into Jerusalem this time, something was a little different. It seems like the people had recognized the time. It seems like the people had recognized the time. They recognized that this was indeed the Messiah. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he set in motion the wheels for his crucifixion. And if we read on the account of what it said in Mark chapter 11, we will see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees decided that they were going to find a way to somehow get Jesus killed. We need to understand that this is very important because there was going to be a shift in time. Jesus was about to be crucified. A few days later, the destiny of all mankind was going to change. Something was going to snap. Something was going to change in the realm of the spirit. And this was not going to happen just for one person. But this was going to happen for all of humanity. Something was going to change and the history of mankind was not going to be the same again. Mankind who didn't have hope was going to have the hope of redemption by the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Now the people who screamed Hosanna, the people who praised Jesus may not have fully understood what was going to happen. Maybe they couldn't really comprehend what was going to take place. But yet, it seems like they had recognized that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And they also recognized this, that he was representing the line of David. This morning, we are seated here as God's children. We are children who are filled in God's spirit. We are people who are led in the spirit. But I want to ask us this question. Do you and I recognize the signs of the times that we are living in? Do we recognize that Jesus is indeed coming soon? Do we recognize that God is waiting to do a work? Do we recognize in our spirit that there is going to be a mighty outpouring that is about to break loose? When we go back into the Old Testament, we see the prophet Elijah. He goes and he addresses the king very boldly. And he recognizes that the the drought at the season at that time was because the Lord had extended his hand. He also recognized that there was rain coming. And Elijah postured himself to receive that rain. As God's children who have been appointed for such a time as this, do we recognize that the times are apparent? We are hearing about wars. We are hearing about the rumors of wars. There is so much of sickness, there is death, there is, there is chaos that is going on in the world. And are you and I awakened to what the Lord is doing? Do we recognize what the Holy Spirit is looking to do? Do we recognize God's hand in all of this? What I mean by this is this. When we walk closely with God, there is a degree of awareness that comes about. God in his grace, he desires to partner with you and I and God makes us privy to what he is doing. He gives us an indication what he is doing and about what he is about to do. We see many examples of this taking place. We see Abraham, how God revealed what he was going to do in that city of Sodom. Elijah, I spoke about it a little earlier. I think of our cricket coach, our current cricket coach, Chandika Hathrusingha, who is held in high esteem in the cricketing circle. And most of us know his abilities. And I'm told that his strength lies in reading the game. His strength lies in understanding a match situation. That's what his strength is, and he knows exactly what to do. This morning, I'd like us to ask ourselves, are you and I reading what is going on in the spiritual realm? Are your ears, are my ears kept to the ground, waiting to understand, Lord, 
what is going on? Do we know what's happening? Are we aware? Do we recognize that the Lord is at work? Do we recognize that there is an awakening that is about to come forth? Do we recognize that there is a shift that is going to take place? I want to challenge you this morning. If you and I are numb to what God is doing, if you and I have no clue of what is happening, if you and I are just walking to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, not understanding what is going on, I believe we've got to open our hearts a little bit more and say, Lord, I need to know what is going on. We need to make a decision that we ought to get serious with God. We ought to get serious with our walk with God. Secondly, we see in this scripture how when Jesus comes into Jerusalem first, Jesus walks into the temple and what the scripture says is that he does one thing. In verse 11 it says, So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple after looking around carefully at everything. He left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. What the scripture says is, he came into the temple and after looking carefully at everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 tells us something. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Today you and I are living in the New Testament times and God's presence dwells inside of us. Would you say amen to that? We are told that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I have been made the temple of God. And when the Holy Spirit would come into our lives, when he would look around, when he would look into our hearts, when he would put that searchlight into our hearts, when he would test our motives, when he would come and test our ambitions, when he would look into our thoughts, when he would look into our very actions, what would the Holy Spirit see in our heart? Is this temple a pleasing place for God to dwell in? I believe there are some areas that we need to consider. We need to consider our business transactions, the way we do business, the kind of deals that we would put. We need to look at our relationships with one another. We need to look at our purity. We need to look at the things that we would do in private, the conversations that we would engage in, the kind of things that we would access even on our electronic devices. And if you and I know that we have fallen short in this area or in these areas, let me assure you, there is no condemnation. Hallelujah. If we were to go to God in repentance, if we were to go to God with an open heart and say, Lord, I have fallen short, the Lord would give us his cleansing. As the children of God, you and I have a responsibility to make sure that these temples, that these hearts have not been given over to a den of thieves. When Jesus returned to the temple, Jesus had to do something very drastic. He took some drastic steps. He had to overturn the tables and he had to, some accounts say that he had to whip some of them. What would Jesus have to do? Such was the harshness with which Jesus confronted that which displeased him. We sometimes take God's grace for granted. And we say, oh, God is gracious. God is full of grace and he forgives and he forgives and he forgets. But let me tell you, my brother and my sister, if we continue to take God's grace for granted, we don't want to be on the wrath end of our Lord. God is calling us to test our hearts. God is calling us to look at who we are. God is calling us to a walk of reality with him, not to a walk of superficiality where we tell ourselves everything is okay, all is good, and we have this, this, this severe which is on our, across our hearts, and we, we, we have this gap between ourselves and God. God is calling us 
to a place of reality. God is calling us to a place of openness of our hearts. My brother, my sister, we do not want God to chastise us. We want to search ourselves. We want to go before God and sit in front of the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, convict me, bring conviction upon my heart. God is calling us to uphold these standards. God is calling us to uphold these principles in our lives. And if we are falling short, the Lord would say to us, turn to me, repent. I have granted you my grace. Would you open yourself? Because the word of God is very clear. The word of God tells us if we were to God, if we were to go to God with a broken and contrite heart, he would not despise us. Hallelujah. The word of God tells us that we could go to him and reason with him, talk it over with him. But my brother, my sister, let us not use that as a license to continue in our wicked ways. Let us not use that as a license to continue with our selfish ambition. Let us not use that as a license to continue to make our hearts impure. God is calling us to a higher standard this morning. And I believe Jesus is knocking on every one of our hearts this morning. He's probing into every one of our hearts. He is searching our spirit this morning. If only you would awaken yourself to what he is doing. Thirdly, Jesus says, my house shall be called a temple of prayer. In verse 17, he comes and declares it boldly and he says, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When I read this scripture, I see a, a picture of the tabernacle of God. I see a picture of the holy place in the Old Testament where, where it was a continuous incense that was rising up to God. An incense of worship, an incense of prayer, an incense of communion, or incense of oneness with God. A sweet offering that would bring pleasure to God. And like I said before, God has declared that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit, should there not be an incense that would rise up to him continuously, every moment, every day, every week, every month. The Lord is calling us to a life of prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul says, we must never cease to pray. And I don't think Paul was implying that we need to be on our knees 24 hours where we are so heavenly minded and we are without any earthly use. No, that's not what Paul was talking about. But I'm convinced that Paul was referring to praying in the spirit every moment of the day. I believe Paul was referring to us walking in the presence of God every moment of the day. I believe Paul was referring to us being aware of the presence of the counsel of the work of the Holy Spirit in our day to day. I believe Paul was referring to a life that was devoted to walking closely with God in obedience to his voice. My house shall be called a temple of prayer. My brother, my sister, most of our prayers have become very selfish. Our prayers have been, become so self-centered. Most of our prayer requests are all about extending our kingdom, extending our benefits, extending our best interest. Sometimes I've heard this, people, people would come and say, you know, I want to thank God because I fasted for 40 days and God answered this earthly need. But I wonder, I wonder if you and I would go before God in fasting and in prayer and say, Lord, 
give me more of you. I wonder what has happened to the prayers where we would say, Lord, I am so hungry for you. I wonder what has happened to the kind of prayers that we would pray and say, Lord, only you will satisfy me. I will not leave this place unless you go with me. Lord, prepare me. Let me be a sanctuary. I wonder what has happened to the prayers where we would say, Lord, let my life be a pleasing dwelling place for you. I wonder if we would pray those prayers that the psalmist prayed and said, one thing I desire that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Unfortunately, our prayer list or our prayer life has often got limited to a checklist where we just want to clock a certain number of hours or a certain number of minutes just to have that feel good factor and tell ourselves, all right, I have gone before God, I have done my dues. Now let me get on with my day. Our prayer lives have often been limited to seasons of times where we just want God to come and bless our programs. But I believe God is calling us this morning to a different level of prayer. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is tugging at our hearts this morning and saying, come, let my house, let my temple be a house of prayer. God is inviting us this morning and saying, come, come into a continuous communion with him. It was Leonard Ravenhill who said, he said this about prayer. He said, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers but few agonizers. Many players and pairs, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. As I said before, a life of prayer is not birthed out of a program. Let me tell you, a life of prayer is birthed from a place of devotion and not out of duty. And I'll say that again. A life of prayer is birthed out of devotion and not out of duty. Let me tell you, our lives would be powerless if we don't have the fuel of prayer. We will be rendered helpless and wanting and lacking if we don't pray when the enemy brings his attacks. Our walk with God will be lifeless. It would be tasteless if we don't have the foundation of prayer. Unfortunately, if we don't take time to get intimate with God, if we don't take time to be with God, if we don't take time to know the ways of our Father, we might hear the words, away with you, I know you not. And this morning, I cannot stress the importance of prayer. Moving on. Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer. And he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. As a church, we always talk about bringing revival and transformation into our nation. Unless you and I are to heed the words of Jesus, unless we carry a vision for our nation, I assure you, you and I are not going to see that change that we are talking about and should Jesus tarry, we are not going to see that change in our lifetime. We talk about revival, but we don't want to pay the price for revival. Revivals always broke out of agonizing prayer and not comfortable programs that would keep church people happy. Psalm 2 verse 8 says, Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance the whole earth as your possession. This morning, Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. Do you and I 
carry a serious vision? Do you and I carry a serious burden for our nation? Do we truly desire to see the words of Reverend W. Senior, which we sing so often, which says, To him our land shall listen, to him our land shall kneel. All rule be on his shoulder, all wrong beneath his heel. O consummation glorious, which now by faith we sing, come cast we up the highway that brings us back the king. Is the nation truly our desire? God is calling us to a place of prayer. God is calling us this morning to a place of agonizing in his presence with our hearts torn open, crying out to him and saying, Lord, do something. Lord, do something. Do something. Change my heart. Change my nation. God is looking for people like that. I want to challenge you this morning. Would you dare to pray the prayer of the psalmist? Would you dare to ask God for this nation? Would you dare to ask God for a transformation that we would see it in this generation? It took one man, our founder pastor, Pastor Colton, to wait on God, to hear his voice, to step out in faith, carrying the fire of God, and to persistently see the vision come to pass. Would you and I do that? I don't know about you, but my heart aches to see a transformed Sri Lanka. My heart aches to see this nation transformed. My heart aches to see Sri Lanka being called the most preferred destination in this world. It was Charles Wesley who said, catch on fire with enthusiasm and people will come for miles to watch you burn. Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to ignite you with a fire, with a burden? Are you willing to tell, Lord, I am committing myself to a life of prayer. I'm committing myself to keep my heart open before you. That fire begins to take flame only when we decide to transform our hearts into a house of prayer. That fire begins to take flame only if you and I were to decide that our temple is going to be transformed. And the decision lies with you and me. And Jesus, out of his grace, out of the goodness, because it is his desire that none should perish, I believe Jesus is knocking at the hearts of our door this morning and saying, would you commit yourself? Would you allow me to do such a work in you where your heart, where your life will be a house of prayer? And my brother, my sister, let me tell you this morning, if you and I were to do that, if you and I were to take that step forward and say, Lord, I am that person, I am your person, we can't imagine the kind of work the Lord would do through us. Hallelujah. We can't imagine the kind of force that God would transform us into in bringing change and salvation into this nation. We can't imagine the glory of God that would be manifest in our midst so that our nation would see that fire, so that our nation would see that glory and be drawn to that river of life that flows. Mm -hmm.